Hello, good afternoon. Welcome. I'm so glad to see such a great group. All bright eyed. Let's see, checks. All bright eyes, yes. <laughs> At least brighter than mine, so that, that counts. So great to see you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate the support. Uh, this is always a lot of fun for me. And it's mostly fun for the residents, although I, I th they impress me so much, to tell you the truth, just be honest. Um, I don't think they have any stage fright. But the last two groups have said, oh, I'm really nervous doing this. I couldn't tell it, but uh, so but we'll, we'll see. Um, good to see you all. Uh, it it kind of feels like things are opening up, doesn't it, a little bit? You know, we're heading the right direction. I don't want to jinx it by saying that, but... Uh, you know, things are moving in the, in the right direction. Um, so, well, today, and, and just to set the stage for any of you who might not have been in on this before, we try to do this once a month. Um, so once during the, the uh, time that a particular two-person group of residents are here, so they're here for w what we call one block, it's four weeks, really. So they do it on the fourth week. This is the, these young physicians have been here four weeks this week, and so that's when we time it. Um, and we try to pick a, a, a topic that's uh, somehow related to health and aging, and uh, anything to do with health is also to do with aging, it seems. Um, and uh, and we we. Uh, try to uh, make it something that's a common, uh, you know, topic of, of real interest. Atrial fibrillation happens to be that. Uh, we hear too much of it. We see too many people with it, but fortunately it's very treatable uh, and also very important to be treated. Uh, so I think uh, most of you don't have atrial fibrillation, but I dare say there's more than a handful in this room that do. We, w we won't call you out. We won't ask for a show of hands. Uh, but but if you don't have it, you know, uh, you might have it before this life is over. <laughs> it's going to happen to a lot of us. So uh, it's a lot more treatable than it used to be. So I think it's, a, it's mostly good news that we can share. Um, so I want to introduce these two young physicians uh, who, as I've told you, have been here. They're both from Missouri. Hmm, I think that's good. I'm getting a better impression of Missouri uh, from, uh, always had a good impression of Missouri. I did my training in St. Louis. Um, so nearest to me uh, is Dr. August Martin. Um, and it's, it, you only go by August, right? It's no, nobody calls you Gus or Gusty or anything like that. And maybe we'll start doing that. No, 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 no. Um, he grew up in St. Louis, and uh, and has and finished medical school at the osteopathic hospital in Kirksville, Missouri. As a matter of fact, they went to the same medical school, even though they weren't in the same in the same class. Um, so he's he's a first year resident. So just as a reminder, this program that we have, training program in internal medicine is a three-year program. So you typically, traditionally, start a training program like this in within a month of, of getting your medical degree. Some people start later, but that's what they did in the traditional way. Um, so he's a first-year medical resident in internal medicine. And uh, Dr. Ethan Anderson, in the far right, is an upper. He's an upper. He's an upperclassman. So he's in his second year, and by the way, two or three more months, they'll be into their next year. So we're getting on the, on the uh, later end of, of uh, the training year. So um, Dr. Anderson also grew up in Missouri, as I've mentioned, in Kirksville, Missouri, which, uh, and, and went to college at Drury. Some of you will be uh, familiar with Drury University, isn't it? College, uh, yeah, university in Springfield uh, has a great reputation. So he's been there, and then for medical school he went home to Kirksville, which is where their medical school, AT Still, 
osteopathic uh, college has a great reputation and the, and the trainees that we've had are fantastic and uh, we've interviewed a lot of people that we didn't get that we would have been happy to get from there so it's a good place and um, his father uh, Dr. Anderson's father is also a physician so he's following his footsteps uh, a hematologist oncologist in in Jeff City Missouri so with that background, I'll, I'll hand it over to them. I think they're going to team this as they usually do. And we'll have questions and answers at the end. Thank you, Dr. Wright. My name is Dr. August Martin. I do go, my family did call me Gus growing up, but it's something that I got away from pretty fast as soon as I left St. Louis. Um, my grandpa always used to say, call me whatever you want, just don't call me late for dinner. And I try to abide by that now. Um, gusty? I've never heard Gusty. I've never heard Gusty. Um, I grew up in St. Louis, Rolla area. I went to school in Colorado. Um, I went back to St. Louis and I did my master's uh, in research in cardiac morphogenesis in zebrafish. And I got a master's in anatomy. And I actually taught the med students physical therapy students, um, heart anatomy. So when I heard we were doing the atrial fibrillation, I got kind of excited. Um, my dad and my grandfather are also cardiologists. Um, so it is fibrillation, not fibrillation on. That's, yeah, doesn't bode well for the formatting for the rest of this, but on our computers it looked okay, so hopefully it's all right. Um, oh, thank you. So here we just have the basic heart anatomy. Um, the, uh, it's oriented as if you were looking at the patient. So if this were my heart, that's the right side and that's the left side. Blue depicts um, venous structures usually going back to the heart, uh, with some exceptions we'll get into. But there are four chambers in the heart. Ethan, if you want to. So then we have uh, blood comes in back from the systemic vasculature into the right atrium. Um, then you have the two big structures on the bottom. Those are the, we'll go through the flow in a sec, but these are the ventricles. Um, the atria are kind of, you can think of it as uh, receiving rooms. They're like the staging rooms. And then the blood flows into the stronger ventricles and they pump it to bigger circulation further distances. So this is just going through the flow of the heart. Actually, I can just do this. This is just going through the flow of the heart. Um, so one comes back in from the systemic vasculature into that right atria, dumps into that right ventricle, and out through the pulmonary arteries. It then goes to the lungs, receives oxygen from the lungs, comes back to the left side of the heart into the, through the left, art, er, um, left pulmonary veins and into the left atrium, and then left ventricle, out through the aorta, and then it goes to the systemic vasculature, and to the body, to the brain. So the way that um, muscles and the heart being, you know, the muscle that really never stops working, um, as long as we're alive, uh, work is um, there are typically, there are nerves that innervate the muscle. They send an electrical impulse from the brain to the muscle, the muscle then responds by contracting. So the reason heart cells are so cool and problematic are that they are both a nerve and a muscle. So they can both conduct electricity and contract. And that's different than most any other cell in the, in the human body. Um, the reason that is that this is the way it is is because it doesn't rely on impulses from the brain. We don't have to think to make our heart beat. It's constantly going. So the way that it works is there every cell in the heart, like we said, can conduct electricity, but some are a little better at conducting than others. Um, in yellow is highlighted the areas of cells in the heart that are better at conducting. And if I showed, if I had a heart with me and I showed everyone, you couldn't tell it's not an anatomically definable structure unless you looked at it under the microscope, but it's certain areas of the heart that tend to depolarize or conduct electricity a little better. Um, and then it travels down and we'll go through the flow of that. So 
the cyanoatrial node um, is that si or sinus node is up there on the top right at the top of the right ventricle, and it you can think about it as almost like a timer. So the time in the cell is constantly ticking down, 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 down. And when the sand runs out of the timer, it, it shoots off an electrical impulse. Every heart in the, or every cell in the heart is also doing this, but at a much slower rate. When one of these cells fires, and since this um, sinus node is going the fastest, it will fire and it'll trigger every other cell to fire, like a domino effect downstream. And so there is my attempt at depicting this on PowerPoint. So it travels from the right atrium into the left atrium, and as the cells receive an electrical stimuli, they contract. So then it gets to the atrioventricular node. So between the two chambers, of the, the four chambers of the heart, there's actually a lot of tissue, connective tissue, that will not conduct electricity. So it stops that electrical impulse, just like wire or, um, rubber around wires in our houses do. But the AV node will allow that um, impulse, that electricity, to get through and kind of guide it through the ventricles. So then the ventricles will contract. So the blood, just to go over it again, blood comes back in and it fills up in the atria. As the atria fill up, this sinus node is ticking down, ticking down, ticking down depolarizes, causes the atria to contract, pushing blood into the ventricles, going through the AV node, and then coming back up around the heart, making that characteristic lub-dub sound if, you, if anyone has ever listened through a uh, stethoscope. So in AFib, what happens is we talked about every cell in the heart kind of having its own timer, and typically the sinus node going a little faster. So with AFib, the other atrial cells, their timers are set a little faster, and so you get multiple areas of depolarization at once. And it's not coordinated. It's not that nice flow of contraction. It's a fibrillation. It's a shaking of the muscle. It's not, and fibrillate means uncoordinated contraction of muscle fibers. Um, so as this happens, eventually one will be strong enough to get to the AV node and send an impulse to the ventricles, and then you'll get a ventricular response. And that's usually pretty coordinated because it's a bottleneck, and it's the atrial cells that are the problem. So this is going through AFib, and that's kind of what I was talking about, the fibrillation you can see depicted there. Um, several signals are going off at once. It's not nice and coordinated coming from the SA node. What the issue is with this is when blood, when flow is not linear and blood cells are bumping into one another, they think that there's an issue with the tissue and they're trying to coagulate to seal that opening or breach off, right? So there is a little area up there, it's called the left atrial appendage in the left atrium and almost looks kind of like a little ear hanging off the heart. Why it's significant is when this turbulent flow is going on, Blood can circulate there and start to coagulate and pool, um, which is an issue if you, if it gets dislodged into the ventricles, because um, eventually these signals will reach the ventricles, and it'll uh, they will push it to the rest of the circulation. So if that little clot becomes dislodged, it goes into a ventricle, and the ventricle will push it. It can get lodged in a blood vessel into the brain, and that's when you have something like a stroke. So there's several classifications of AFib. Um, there's definitely more words up there than I probably needed, but um, paroxysmal is basically just intermittent, meaning it comes and goes. So if you hear a doctor say you have paroxysmal AFib, that means you're not always in AFib. It just happens every now and again. There's persistent AFib, which is AFib that you know doesn't self-terminate. Um, and then each of these kind of requires different management. Permanent AFib being AFib also called chronic AFib. It's just AFib that you and your doctor have talked about and that they're okay with not going away. So what's kind of tricky about AFib is it's sometimes rare that people will feel it or have symptoms from it. And when they have symptoms, it's very generalized. 
It can be just a lightheadedness, kind of feeling like under the weather, tired. Um, sometimes it'll be short of breath. Um, more severe symptoms, um, you're going to start to see stuff like chest pain or fainting, um, and then stroke like we talked about earlier. So I think this is, uh oh, we've got risk factors still. Um, so the risk factors for AFib, you see it with increasing age, and that's what the graphs up on the um, right-hand side depict. And you see as people get older, their chances of getting AFib go up. Um, men typically have it more than women. I think there's a study done, and there was 1.1% of men and 0.8% of women um, above a certain age have it. So it's, it's fairly common. Um, high blood pressure and heart disease, alcohol excess, heart failure, alveolar heart disease, sleep apnea, obesity, diabetes, kidney disease, family history, which is, I think you could copy that last part and put it up pretty much on any chronic like, condition <laughs> in medicine. But really anything that applies stress and irritates the muscle cells in the atria can cause AFib, can cause that ticker to go a little faster. Now, holiday heart syndrome, see a lot of this happen in the holidays because excessive alcohol intake not chronic intake necessarily, but excessive alcohol intake when you don't usually drink can stress the heart and cause something called holiday heart syndrome. And if somebody that hasn't had AFib prior comes in all of a sudden with AFib around Christmas time. So I think this is where hand you off to Dr. Anderson. Yep. All right. So like I said, my name is Dr. Anderson. I'm a second year resident. Uh, so I took the back half of this presentation. Um, so I'll just kind of mention some of the classic presenting symptoms you'll have. Um, you know, if you do have, most of the time when patients become symptomatic, um, it's when their heart rate is beating too fast. So oftentimes that aberrant conduction through the atria will be sent through that AV node down into the ventricles too fast, and patients' heart rates will jump up into the 120s, 150s, sometimes even faster. And that's when you really start to become symptomatic, and oftentimes that's when patients find out they even have AFib. Um, so along with that, you'll have these classic symptoms of heart palpitations, your heart feeling like it's skipping beats, uh, beating too fast, tachycardia would be beating too fast, um, and that leads to those symptoms of fatigue and shortness of breath and weakness. Um, can also, you can have things like increased urine output, shortness of breath, um, and then as that continues, you can start having uh, chest pain because the heart muscles themselves are starting to become damaged with how hard and how fast they're being stressed. Um, and then all this can lead to blood pressure fluctuations. Um, so you can have low blood pressure, high blood pressure, and that lower blood pressure often causes things like presyncope or that, oh, I'm almost about to faint, or even sometimes uh, you to actually faint completely. Um, and like August said, um, this all sets you up for higher risks of strokes. So that's another classic some thing that we'll have patients come to the hospital with, with acute strokes. Um, and in the workup of that, we find out, lo and behold, they actually have AFib and didn't know it this whole time. So this is a little bit of a busy slide. Um, starting off the evaluation that we would typically see patients uh, with AFib, uh, we start off with a good physical exam and a history, uh, looking for um, asking about any precipitating factors that may have led to um, their symptoms, whether they were very stressed out, um, exercised too hard, um, had um, any acute illnesses, like I said, too much alcohol intake, uh, things like that. Um, and then we look at their past medical history as well. So things like strokes, they've had strokes in the past, um, that can be a red flag. Uh, if they have high blood pressure, COPD, um, obstructive sleep apnea, or commonly hyperthyroidism. Um, those are some of the classic ones that we look for um, if a patient comes in with AFib. Um, as far as the, you know, physical exam, it's an issue with the heart, so that's kind of where our physical exam is relied upon. Uh, we listen to the heart, um, you know, valvular it disease itself or valvular uh, dysfunction um, can cause stress on the uh, atria themselves, um, and that can lead to that overexcitation of these muscle fibers uh, to uh, send out electrical signals and electrical impulses leading to AFib. So we listen for murmurs of, of the heart, which are um, aortic, or sorry, valvular deficiencies. Um, and then the classic uh, description of AFib is the irregularly irregular heartbeat. Um, 
you have just a uh, disjointed, um, you know, you th like I said, you have that lub dub typically, but this will be heart rates kind of bouncing all over the place. It's not regular. It's it's very erratic, um, and that's what we listen for. Um, to diagnose this, uh, you, you need an EKG or some type of cardiac uh, drawing of uh, what it would look like. And I don't necessarily expect anybody to know what these are, are looking like, but I just threw these up as examples of EKGs that are typical um, for patients with AFib. Um, the classic is it, it, there's no discrete P wave. So a P wave on the electrical drawing of the, of the heart cycle is the, um, the P wave is the atrial electrical signal right before it contracts. Um, and with AFib, because you have so many spots that are doing that all at one time, the EKG machine can't read it appropriately. So it'll either be a flat line or a bunch of different size lines before you have that real tall spike, which is the ventricle uh, electrical impulse. Um, and then this lower EKG is what we call AFib with rapid ventricular response, which is when patients become more symptomatic um, and the uh, that electrical signal is being fired through the AV node into the second half of the heart, into the big ventricles, um, a lot faster than what it should. And um, that's when patients typically become more sim symptomatic. So further evaluation, um, this is just a, a full workup of patients with AFib. We then will look at uh, echocardiograms, which is the ultrasound of the heart. Um, that uh, gives us an idea of uh, what the shape and size and function of the muscle it's, it's themselves are doing. So we look at the atria. Um, if atria, if they're if they're wider than they should be, or um, you know, uh, when they're really ballooned out and distended, that can be a sign that they may have issues like high blood pressure or a blood clot in their lung causing stress on that atria to can't pump against the uh, restrictive flow. Um, same thing with the ventricles. You know, we look at the same the same issue, um, and they can also detect that valvular uh, disease that we're talking about that can uh, lead to some of these uh, issues. Uh, so, if patients have valves that are not coming together when the heart stops contracting, um, or they're you know kind of staying open or not opening wide enough, those are all things that can lead to stress on the muscle fibers themselves. And then, oftentimes. Patients may come in and just have kind of an acute episode of AFib, and we hear it on our stethoscope, but by the time we get an EKG machine on them, the AFib has resolved, and we can't prove that they actually had it. So we'll oftentimes send patients out on a loop recorder. It's basically you strap a heart monitor on, or they implant a heart monitor sometimes, or do a patch, and it'll watch your heart rate and your the rhythm of your heart with like a single lead EKG, essentially, and uh, be able to watch what your heart is doing and, and catch if you go into AFib, and then you go back to the, your primary care or your cardiologist, and they can see how many times you might have gone into it, if at all. Um, and then common labs that we'll get, um, we'll start off with like a CBC, because uh, anemias can lead to, you know, can lead to uh, AFib. Uh, renal function, so a, a basic metabolic panel to look at all the electrolytes and your renal function. Uh, A1C to look if you have diabetes, because diabetes can set you up for um, going into AFib as well. And then the TSH and the T4, which are just uh, looking at the thyroid uh, function, seeing how well your thi thyroid's working, whether it's producing too much thyroid hormone, which uh, if you have hyperthyroidism or you're taking, if you have hypothyroidism and you're taking too much of your thyroid medication, it can send you into AFib. It can overexcite things and cause you to go into AFib. So once the diagnosis is established, um, we go into management. And AFib management is kind of interesting because there's different methods and it's kind of provider dependent at times. Um, so our main resource kind of gave broke it down into this ABC pathway of, of your thought process. The A being uh, anticoagulation. So if any of you have AFib, um, you're likely on some type of blood thinner unless you've opted out of that. Um, this is because, like August said, that anatomy of the heart, there's that left atrial appendage, and when the heart is, f the atria are fibrillating, blood's not flowing appropriately, and the blood starts to clot. And when it finally does fire, it can send that clot up to the brain and cause a stroke. Um, AFib itself may not kill you, but those complicating factors like a stroke um, can. Um, so that's something we look for, and so we calculate patients' risks of stroke versus the risk of bleeding. 
Um, and if their risk of stroke outweighs the risk of a significant bleed, then they uh, typically qualify for a blood thinner, uh, like Eliquis or Warfarin. Um, the B in this pathway is better symptom control, which would be rate control versus rhythm control. So keeping the heart rate slow so you don't be symptomatic or trying to get your heart to stay out of AFib. Um, sometimes that's not, op that's not possible. Um, there's different methods to try and get you out and keep you out, but uh, they don't always work. So rate control is always a way to fall back uh, to keep your symptoms under control. And then uh, the C of this is your cardiac or cardiovascular risk factors or other comorbid factors that might be causing you to be in AFib. So we look at things like obesity, sleep apnea, high blood pressure, heart failure, um, you know, COPD, anything like this that we can treat that will help better keep your heart from being further stressed. Um, again, that's another busy slide. There's quite a bit of information. Um, <clears throat> so Oftentimes when we first see patients in the hospital or in clinic with AFib, we kind of start thinking, well, why, might, why did they go into AFib? Are there any reversible causes? So patients who've had recent cardiac surgery where uh, manipulation of the cardiac muscles um, actually caused them to be irritated, and that's why they may have gone into AFib. That's usually temporary and should go away. Pericarditis, there's a, a sac that, that is around the heart to help protect it. Um, and that can get inflamed as well, and that can cause the heart muscles themselves to get uh, irritated and, again, go into AFib. If you've had a heart attack, uh, those, those myocardial cells start to become ischemic, um, and that can cause patients to go into AFib. And if you get a cath and you clear that and the heart muscles are perfused again, they recover and you should stay out of AFib. Um, hyperthyroidism, which is a reversible, treatable um, uh, issue uh, that can, if you treat that, then they should stay out of AFib as well. And then pulmonary embolism uh, is another thing that can be treated and help keep patients out of AFib. So if we treat the underlying causes, sometimes you can keep patients out of AFib permanently, but there are other times where there's just nothing you can do that patients are going to go in and out of AFib or stay in AFib permanently. Um, so for the acute management, there's two major components, like we said, is uh, symptom control is going to be your main thing. So when patients first come in, we want to try and control their heart rate. So we'll put them on base beta blockers like metoprolol or carvedilol, which some of you may be on, or calcium channel blockers like diltiazem, or, um, and, and those will help keep the heart rate under control, at least in the meantime. And then we decide, should we get this patient out of AFib by medication or electro, electric um, cardioversion, or do we want to just let them keep their heart rate under control? So um, that's kind of a decision we have that attending, or physicians have to make, cardiologists um, typically make these decisions with the patients. They kind of, it's a joint decision. Um, the indications for cardioversion, um, kind of hard indications for cardioversion, are patients who are hemodynamically unstable, meaning their blood pressure is low and they can't get it up regardless of what they do because the heart rate is not, it, the, it's not beating appropriately in a um, coordinated fashion. If this is the case, then cardioversion or doing it by medication um, with a drug called like amiodarone, things like that, or sh actually shocking the heart itself um, to get them back into a coordinated uh, rhythm, um, that's when that's indicated. Another uh, indication typically is patients who ha have their first diagnosis ever of AFib, um, oftentimes cardiologists say we, need to, we, we want to give them at least one chance to get out of AFib and stay out of AFib, uh, so they'll give them at least one good cardioversion uh, to try and keep them out of that. Um, or if patients who have paroxysmal AFib and their heart rate is controlled but they remain symptomatic and the symptoms are just too much for them to bear on a daily basis, oftentimes they will be cardioverted to see if that helps their symptoms improve. Um, patients who need hospitalized um, are patients who the AFib sends them into heart failure where they um, have swelling in their legs, they can't breathe, they have swelling in their lungs or fluid in their lungs, things like that all related to the AFib. If their blood pressure is too low, like we talked about, that, that can um, be a reason why patients may need to be hospitalized for this. Or if they can't control their rate on oral medications, they need something a little bit stronger to, to take care of it. Um, another common reason would be if you're initiating or starting a medication to help keep you out of AFib, um, they have 
some of them have quite a few risks and toxicities that need to be watched for in the acute uh, period of it. So they'll keep you in the hospital for a short period of time while you start these medications. And then um, if you have any other associated uh, problems that are sending you into AFib, like um, acutely elevated high blood pressures where your blood pressure is like over 200, um, or if you have a pneumonia or um, thyroid storm where your thyroid's acting up and just producing way too much thyroid hormone. These are reasons why you might be in the hospital and they might find AFib um, and then you're just, you're being treated for both at that time. Um, <clears throat> so for patients who have a new diagnosis of AFib, um, like we talked about the, oftentimes they present because they're just symptomatic from their heart beating too fast. So this is another one of those, we have two main decision points here, whether we um, start anticoagulation or not, and whether we do rate versus rhythm control. So starting off with the uh, anticoagulation, uh, there's two scores that we look at. There's the chads vas score, which is your risk of developing a stroke. Um, and it's really hard to see what that says, um, but these are all, each one of these has a point system. So uh, heart failure is one point, high blood pressure is one point. If you're over the age of 75, that's actually two points. Um, it is really blurry. Diabetes is one point. Um, if you've had a previous stroke or other type of embolic event or a clot, that is actually two points. Um, if you've had um, a heart attack, things like that, that's one point. Um, if you're between the ages of 65 and 74, that's just one point. And if you're a female, that's another point. Um, and the total, the highest score you can get on a Chad's vast score is nine. Um, same with the has blood score, the highest you can get is nine. And the has blood score is your risk of uh, developing a um, dangerous bleed if you are on anticoagulation. So the uh, characteristics that go into this are high blood pressure, um, if you have abnormal renal or liver function. Um, so you can actually get two points for that because you, if you have renal function, that's diminished, that's one point. If you have liver function, that's one point. So if you have both, that's two. Um, stroke can, is, is a point. Um, Bleeding tendencies or predispositions, that's one point. If you're on warfarin already, that's one point. If you have libel INRs where you're, you're, you're becoming, your blood's becoming too thin, setting you up for risk of bleed. If you're elderly, which is over the age of 65, um, that's one point. <laughs> and uh, certain drugs like aspirin or NSAIDs, um, like ibuprofen, um, naproxen, or if, or if you drink alcohol, excessive alcohol, that can uh, set you up for bleed as well. So that's one or two points uh, for each. Again, the maximum score is nine. So when we do both of these scores, if your CHADS VAS score is higher than your HAS blood score, then you meet criteria for anticoagulation if you have a diagnosis of AFib. Um, <clears throat> there's a caveat to that. So the non-valvular AFib, so AFib in which your, the valves of your heart are not involved or leading to why you have AFib, you can use what are called DOACs, and they're just one or two time pills a day, um, and those are things that are commonly known as Pradaxa, Zorelto, Eliquis, Cerveza, and Bevexa. Um, so a, a lot of patients are on these. They're very, very expensive at times, um, but they're really easy to manage. You just give them to them. You don't have to monitor them. So patients typically like them. For valvular AFib, which are, you know, the valve is either damaged and that's what's causing the AFib or might be causing the AFib, or if patients have had a prosthetic valve place or valve replacement or repair, they, these DOACs, the first list, have not actually been studied in valvular AFib um, appropriately, so we don't know if they work as well as warfarin. So that's why warfarin or Coumadin is the medication that you'll be placed on for that. And with that, you do have to get INR checked regularly to make sure you don't have too much or too little um, to make sure that your blood is anticoagulated enough. Um, another caveat to this is patients who um, maybe don't want to be on anticoagulation lifelong um, or are at an increased risk of bleeding um, because of falls or for whatever reason, um, they can have this device called a watchman device. Um, and it's a, essentially a, a screen or a plug that gets put up in that left atrial appendage where, that, where we think the blood clots typically form. Um, and they can just, the cardiologist can go up through the groin or in the wrist and place this device 
in uh, that left atrial appendage to help prevent clots from forming back there and then dislodging and going into the uh, circulation. Um, the risk of this, of not having any type of stroke or clot isn't zero, but it is better than, you know, not being on anticoagulation and not getting the uh, Watchman device. So that's just kind of another caveat that some of you may know about. Um, so on to the rate versus rhythm control. Um, <clears throat> so again, most patients feel symptomatic when their heart rates are really high, above 120, 130s, 140s, 50s, whatever it may be. As long If they're up that high, typically patients start feeling symptomatic. So our main goal is just bring that heart rate down. And that can be either through rate control, um, which uh, August mentioned there's those two main spots where the electrical signal is um, sent through the heart. So that spot in the middle where the electrical impulse goes from the atria to the ventricles, that's called the AV node. And we have medications that help slow the electrical signal through that node, uh, which slows the ventricular rate. Um, these are things like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, kind of going out of order here. So metoprolol, carvedilol, um, those are your beta blockers that are typically used for this. And then diltiazem and verapamil would be your calcium channel blockers. And then an old medication that a lot of people know about is called digoxin or uh, digitalis. That's an older med that does the same thing, helps slow that heart rate down. Um, these are typically very well tolerated and oftentimes patients will be on these. Um, now the, the antiarrhythmic medications, um, they are used, uh, especially if patients don't want, they, they want to try and be you know, out of AFib and they don't like remotely having a risk of stroke. Um, these can be medications or there's other strategies like we talked about the um, ablation therapy. Um, you can either do that percutaneously or surgically. You go in there and you can burn some of the cardiac myocyte cells with the electrophysiologist. Um, uh, they're cardiologists that specialize in the electrical conduction of the heart. So they're kind of a subspecialty of cardiology. They'll kind of help go in there and map where they think the electrical signals that are aberrant are coming from. And they can go in there with a catheter and <coughs> kind of burn the areas or do alcohol injections in those areas to kill those myocytes, those, those muscle cells to help reduce the amount of aberrant electrical conduction that's going on in the atria themselves. Um, let's see, the antiarrhythmic medications, uh, there's quite a few, and like I said, a lot of them have some, some toxicities and risks that um, can be dangerous in the acute phase and need to be uh, monitored. I have not seen some of these ever used, um, but I am familiar with a few. Um, so, disopramide, um, uh, Quinidide, quinidide uh, flecainide, pro, uh, propafenone, amiodarone, dofetilide, dronetarone, and sodalol. Those are all the rate or the rhythm control medications um, that are commonly used. The most common ones I've seen are amiodarone, sodalol, and flecainide. So just the ones that I've seen are about three. Um, so these are common, um, and. A big part of this, the data data suggests that all, of all the data that we see between rate versus rhythm control, um, most of it shows that the mortality and morbidity uh, rates are about the same. So it's kind of hard to tell whether doing one method versus the other is actually better. It kind of comes down to that discussion with your cardiologist and your primary care doc and your own um, feeling about which method you want to use to control your AFib. Um, Rhythm controlled is preferred in patients um, who remain symptomatic with rate control alone um, or young patients who develop AFib and the risk or the, the worry that they're, because AFib causes more stress on those muscle cells, the muscles kind of start to reorganize and reshape themselves leading to further issues down the line like heart failure. So if that's a worry then with younger patients who may be in AFib for very extended periods of time throughout their life, um, keeping them out of AFib as much as possible is, is typically preferred. And I believe that's all we got. I think we lost Dr. Martin. <laughs> uh, he'll, he'll be back. Um, excellent. Um, well, that's a very, there's a lot of technical information there. I wouldn't expect most of us to uh, to understand all that just from this because there's just so many terms but um, 
but the basics uh, I think are, are really helpful and we can go over any of those that uh, that um, you hear I, I like the fact his last slides he was emphasizing the two approaches are rate control versus rhythm control and to the extent rhythm control could be achieved and maintained easily it would be the choice then you're just not in atrial fib anymore uh, after a certain age, there's that aging word again, um, you know, most of my patients, older adults, <laughs> um, they may stay in, in rhythm control and so in just a normal rhythm uh, for a while. Most people wind up, no matter what you do, failing on rhythm control and, and winding up in chronic atrial fib. And, but the great thing is, uh, really good rate control, which is much easier to achieve, usually uh, results in a person being able to be active and not symptomatic. And, and so it's, uh, it's not a, a big failure when rhythm control won't work. There, I, another thing I would just comment on from y'all's great slides there, great, great graphics, um, how many different things are risk factors? Uh, I've got a brother who's um, a great example of this. So back, uh, he was in his, I think he was in his 50s, living in South Arkansas. He comes up here and he really wants a physical by me, this kind of thing. And we did a stress test on him. Uh, and he immediately went into atrial fib in like stage two of a stress test. And really rapid atrial fib. And so I sent him to a, to a cardiologist back home now, my brother's a big beer drinker, always has been a big beer drinker. Uh, and this cardiologist says, well, George, I, I think if you could just cut back on your alcohol a little bit, uh, you probably won't even have to be on a blood thinner or any, anything else. Which George said, well, great, good. So cut back, how much do you mean? He said, well, let's just say no binge drinking. He says, okay, well, what do you call a binge? He says, well, let's just say don't drink six beers at a time six beers he says <laughs> i call that a sitting <laughs> which is about right i had also told him he really needed to be checked for us have a sleep study checked because it really sounded like his wife was reporting symptoms of uh, sleep apnea his having sleep apnea when she would observe his breathing at night well his insurance wasn't covering that <laughs> And so he never got that done. Three years later, two ablations and probably about six medications later, he gets a sleep study, gets on CPAP, and his atrial fib goes away and never comes back. <laughs> so <laughs> I love to tell that because it's I told you so sort of story on a sibling, you know. But, um, but these other things do have, have an impact and are important to be, to be discussed. Um, Bet you have questions. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm going to give you this. Could you say a little more about how sleep apnea is related? What's going on that that's a risk factor? What, did you want to take that? I don't know. <laughs> no, I, uh, they don't know. <laughs> it's uh, largely unknown. What they think, so we talked about stress on the atria and on the cardiac muscle itself. The cardiac muscle being the muscle that really never stops working as long as you're alive, along with, I guess, the diaphragm um, and your lungs, right? Um, but uh, muscles get irritated when they don't have enough oxygen, um, just like people do. And with sleep apnea, you stop breathing for extended period of time while you're sleeping. That stresses the cardiomyocytes because they're not getting oxygen, and the cardiac muscle requires quite a bit of oxygen. Um, so I think that there's a component of that. They also think with sleep apnea, you have higher rates of what's called pulmonary hypertension. So you can develop high blood pressure specifically in the vasculature in your lungs, um, which makes it harder for the atria to get blood out into the ventricles and everything kind of gets backed up. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? That, that is the answer uh, for sure. Well, well explained. Uh, I don't think they understand completely, but there's a lot of 
you know, there's a lot of understanding that stress on those muscles uh, will absolutely contribute. I saw a hand back here. I actually, <clears throat> I actually have two questions. One is about the watchman. My understanding is that if you, oftentimes if you get the watchman, you can go off of like eloquence and things. Number one is that, how does that work? I have a friend who has it, but he had to go back on eloquence, so it didn't work. Secondly, why is the ventricular fibrillation so much more dangerous than AFib? So I'll answer that first Good one. Uh, the, <clears throat> the watchman sits in that left atrial appendage where when the atria are fibrillating or quivering, that blood just kind of pools in there and then clots. Um, if you don't have that area for the blood to pool and clot, it reduces the amount of risk of clotting. Um, so yes, patients are told they can come off of the eloquist or blood thinners at that time when they get that place because there's less area for a clot to form. Um, but it doesn't mitigate the risk completely. So that risk isn't zero. It's just reduced uh, significantly enough where they're oftentimes comfortable taking patients off anticoagulation. But it doesn't go down to zero. And, it, and neither does anticoagulation. But the, the risk of your bleeding or falling and, and you know, causing some intracranial bleed or things like that uh, while on anticoagulation um, worries enough to sometimes take people off of anticoagulation, but they need that watchman device to mitigate the risk of stroke. Um, <clears throat> so. Part two of the question was, why is VFib so much more dangerous than AFib? Um, we talked about with the anatomy, the atria being kind of the staging chambers. They're much smaller. The muscle is a lot thinner. Um, I guess, the best way to answer it would be say, would is the atria pump blood to the ventricles. So if the atria aren't really working well, you're not going to get as much blood to the ventricles. If the ventricles are in fibrillation and they're going really fast, you're not getting blood to your brain or anywhere. Yeah, I, I think that's it. Uh, I think when you were explaining some of it, he said fibrillation basically means the part of the heart that's fibrillating is just quivering. It's not pumping. It's not pumping. So you can get away with that to an extent with the upper chambers, the atria, just quivering because the, the ventricles will go ahead and pump what blood is had. It, there won't be quite as much blood in the ventricle each, each pump, but, but often people get away with that. That's not a problem, but if the ventricles are quivering, they're the main pumping chambers that are supplying the whole body with blood. The brain doesn't get blood, the other organs don't get blood, and that's, that's, a, that's a, a common way of sudden cardiac death happening is ventricular fibrillation. Your heart's just not beating then. Yes. You've mentioned uh, numerous medications that can be used to treat AFib. Uh, I know that some of these require monitoring. Warfarin's probably the primary example. Are there others that require some type of blood monitoring, and can you say what they are? Yeah, of the list of the anti-arrhythmic medications, um, I can't think of all of them off the top of my head, but some of them cause liver damage or renal damage, uh, so damage to your liver or your kidneys. Um, and those oftentimes, once you first start them, like I said, they'll keep you in the hospital and just make sure they're not going to, you know, damage them right away. Um, but over time, uh, they can build up toxicities in those organs, and you just need to have regular checks. Um, I'm not sure the frequency, but they, they'll, they'll need to be checked periodically. Uh, now, those are not anticoagulant medicines, they're rhythm control medicines, yeah. Digoxin, uh, you check. Flaconide, which ones? Flaconide, digoxin, amniodarone, mm -hmm. lidocaine. Yeah. There'd be a blood test.
I'm sorry. So does the interval and timing vary from drug to drug when you're testing them? Oh, it would. They would usually vary. I mean, they're all not going to be the same, for sure. Is an ablation designed for rate control or rhythm control? Both. Yeah. So with the um, that one slide where I had all the crazy yellow lines circling around, mostly the most common site that an atrial cell goes awry and starts depolarizing faster than it should are in the pulmonary um, is in the pulmonary veins. So by ablating those and burning those cells out and killing them, you take away the aberrant cells, the ones that were depolarizing at a rate faster than which they should have. So by controlling a competing rhythm, you are then defaulting back to your resting cyanoatrial rate, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, Rate control is not hard in most cases. Rhythm control, most of these things are, are about rhythm control and certainly the ablation. If it's successful, it'll, it'll have you out of atrial fib altogether. Good questions, yes. S some of us are wearing Apple watches or other devices that say they detect atrial fibrillation, but what do you all think about that? Is that, <laughs> I'm really doing it? He, or? he says no, I say yes. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I have <laughs> seen three patients in the hospital who have come into the hospital specifically because their Apple Watch told them to come into the hospital um, and told them that they were in AFib and they came in and they were in AFib. Um, I think that it's not a bad idea. I don't think that it's um, extremely sensitive. Um, and, you know, there's not a lot of data on that, but having been in Arkansas at Mercy for a year and having seen three patients, I think that's pretty pretty good. Also, they've got the feature that if you ever fall and can't get up, you can – I've accidentally called emergency services on mine a couple times. You know, we're, we're talking about atrial fibrillation, but there are all sorts of other – We've already talked about ventricular fibrillation. There are other kinds of rhythm disturbances. Um, the Apple Watch and the others, I suppose, too, only claim to detect atrial fibrillation. Um, but I think it does it pretty reliably. Now, is that going to be, is it going to work exactly for you? I don't think they guarantee anything, but, but it seems to work pretty reliably in what I've seen, patients I've seen. Uh, you know, so... It it detects mine when it goes too slow. It, it gets the, it gets the rate right. It won't tell you what the rhythm is, but it'll it'll get the rate right. I was wondering about when I when they check my blood pressure in the heart doctor's office, they say, "Oh, that's good," and then the pulse rate goes off the charts, and nobody's ever said anything about that. Would your pulse rate indicate anything? So the pulse is super variable. It can jump all over the place, and there's a lot of things. So the pulse is super. It can go. It can go really high. It can go low. Um, what matters, I think, is what it's doing consistently over time. What happens consistently over time um, with your pulse rate, I think, is um, what matters. So if I, well, if you stood up and walked across the room, your pulse would go up. Um, blood pressure. It's harder to get an idea. It's like in the cardiologist's office, when you're in the office and you walk in and they have you, you know, they took you up to all the wires and stuff, your pulse is going, my pulse would go up, my blood pressure goes up, but blood pressure is more reliable to look at things over time, whereas your heart rate can change, can go up by 20 or down by 20 within, you know, a couple seconds, just walking up the stairs or walking across the room or thinking about uh, presenting in front of a crowd.
I would defer that to a cardiologist. Okay. I don't, I'm not going to pick a fight with a cardiologist. If they're telling you that, I think there's probably a reason, reason for it. Maybe taking the pace, my guess would be a lot of times when they implant the wires with the pacemaker, um, the cardiac tissue will actually grow around the wires. Um, so maybe, and this is just a guess, but maybe to take the pacer out, they would have to replace the wires and the circuitry as well, which would mean damaging cardiac tissue, which is a b bigger risk. It's not as simple as just changing it out. That would be my, or no, to put a new pacemaker in, I thought is what. Because that battery is only compatible with the older yeah. version, and the new batteries aren't compatible with one you currently have. So they'd have to replace the whole thing. That, that's what I'm thinking too. One. Yeah, because ordinarily there's not this kind of problem. Falling down on the job here. Getting exercise, but I'm falling down on the job. <laughs> I won't comment this time. <laughs> he, he usually does. <laughs> he needs to exercise. <laughs> um, when you have atrial fib, the, the basic question, I think, is, one, does it shorten your life on average? And two, how much does it shorten your life on average? Well, I'm sure statistically, and I'm not, haven't looked at those statistics lately or, or impressed that I ever knew what they were, but I'm sure statistically, if you could find those numbers, that anything you have that could ever be life threatening is going to contribute to a, a shortened life on average in a, in a population. But that, that said, I, I wouldn't want you to think that. Uh, just having atrial fib means you're going to have a shorter life. Because there are plenty of people that live to <laughs> their late 90s with, with atrial fib or with a pacemaker uh, that they've had for 20 or 30 years. I, so, I, you know, it's not a, it's, it's not a, the curse of definitely shortening your life. It, and, and the truth is it's going to prolong your life probably in most cases. Well, untreated atrial fib is what I meant. Uh, you know, having it and having it addressed and treated, you're probably going to live longer than if you just had it and didn't know it. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't check. He's okay for a while. So, well, that. That's um, that's great. I had one other comment. I was going to uh, mention. Oh well, different things make your heart rate go fast. I'm just thinking about the question a while ago. Um, and one of the, you know, stress can people people know that stress wouldn't wouldn't. I mean, if you're prone to atrial fib, stress might make it go faster or flip you into atrial fib when you wouldn't be in it. But the truth is the heart, just with a normal rhythm, will often go faster if you're stressed. Um, stage fright. <laughs> stage fright is classic. And I bring it up because uh, it's been known for several decades now that you take the common medicine for rate control, that would be uh, a beta blocker like metoprolol or enderol, uh, propranolol, those. Uh, you take that. <laughs> And it kind of cures your stage fright for, th for the few hours. So a lot of people do that for stage fright. It, you know, you better check with the doctor and be sure it's safe. But, but it would be in most cases. Uh, you, you, you didn't pop a pill before you came over here, did you? <laughs> His rate was 121 when he walked in. You didn't have to disclose that, you know. Well, thank you for your attention uh, and your questions. You got one more question? 
Exercise makes your heart rate go up, and that's a good thing. And the more often it's exercise-induced, uh, the better your resting heart rate usually will be. You know, when you're aerobically fit, usually your your heart rate is going to be slower at rest. You know, than so that's a good thing. It's usually a marker of a healthy heart. What pre <laughs> huh, okay. That's protected health information. <laughs> uh, see, that's evasive, isn't it? Isn't it? Mine won't be one bit better, but it won't be evasive. I mean, I'll just take a raw guess, and it'll, uh, it could be real wrong. Uh, I'd say, <laughs> you know, I'd say uh, 20 to 25%. That may be high, though. I'm not sure. Uh, you didn't see any statistics for age group. 84? About 20% at age 84, he thinks, from what he looked at. Now we're relying on his memory, though. So, so. <laughs> We have many things to evaluate here. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your participating. Thanks for being here. Right.